Okay, Cabrera, Nick Chafee, Bridget, and Reagan, Lindsay, Benediction, Austin, Zach, No Sally, Okay, the Jerry, Jaren, Twisson. Okay, I don't see Chad or Sally. Is that accurate? All right. Now, I looked at my lecture in the textbook. There's no way that I can actually finish the chapter we're on right now today because I feel it's really necessary to talk about cameras and really necessary to talk about telescopes and microscopes. And I'm not going to be able to cover all of those in one lecture. So, I am pretty certain that you won't need to do an additional um, concept coach for Friday. But let's talk about these things, eyes and cameras. And huh, I chose the wrong aspect ratio for my slides. I did 16 by 10 instead of 16 by 9, it would appear. Anyway, we'll live with it. So, we have here a comparison between a camera and an eyeball. The eyeball, I'm sure you know that I believe God created these eyeballs, is designed so it has a lot of important pieces. So we have here another diagram of eyeballs, if we haven't seen enough of those. This one actually names the sclera, the covering of the cornea, where the actual primary focusing is done. But you have your elements of the cornea, and then you have the iris to give you the pupil, then you have the lens to do the accommodation. Then you have your retina back here. It's a pretty complicated system. Cameras are trying to essentially replicate that using man's best endeavors to achieve the same thing. So a camera is going to have basically the same things as an eyeball has. So here we have a reasonably simple camera. It has first the aperture, actually it's named in the second picture. What, is the, what does the aperture do? Okay, it varies the amount of light coming in. What in the eyeball does the same thing? The iris. So the aperture and the iris are fundamentally the same thing. Now this picture shows a single lens. In a good quality camera you have more than a single lens. You know, in something like an iPhone or a Galaxy, or if you want the biggest, the Nokia, whatever it is, it has 21 lenses in it. There's a lot of lenses there to try to improve the image quality and so on. So this is showing just one, but that's not the typical lens system. In fact, a typical camera has a three lens system here in this position. Those three lenses can have the spacing between them varied and that adjusts the focus. You also have the three lens system to account for some problems with lenses. And let me talk about that first problem right now. We learned about dispersion. If I have a prism and I have sunlight go through the prism, what comes out? Pretty rainbow. We have a dispersion of the light, but why? Not surfaces, different indices of refraction for different colors. That is, different colors have different speeds going through the glass. And so, if we have a lens, that results in having different colors have a different focal length because the refraction is different for different colors. And so, a fundamental problem of a lens is what we call chromatic aberration. Chromatic has to do with color. Aberration is an error in the image. If you use lenses of different types of material, so like one's made of flint glass and one's made of crown glass, the dispersion, the change in index refraction as you go across the visible spectrum is different for the two kinds of glasses. And taking that into account, you can grind the two lenses 
differently to make it so the sum of the two lenses will cancel out the chromatic aberration. And with two lenses, you can cancel out, well, you can make two colors so they have the same focal length. Now, two colors is generally not good enough. A third lens allows you to make three colors have the same focal length, and that's usually considered good enough. So that's another reason for the compound lens, so you can get rid of that chromatic aberration. If you watch sporting events, these days they have really good lenses on their cameras, and they can do a zoom in, and you see the ball, and you don't see any problems. But if you were to go back and watch a football broadcast from 30 years ago, when they zoom in on the line of scrimmage, you'd see the colors spread out. So you'd see like the white line becomes the, the blue line, the red line, the green line. You know, you'd see the colors actually split apart because they didn't have good correction for that chromatic aberration. So you have the lens. Now notice the camera has two pictures. This one here is for when you're, the left one, this one here, for when you're focusing. So you have, I should, by the way, the lens is both the cornea and the lens tied together for the lens. And once again, it's actually compound lens, just like our homework, treat our eyeballs as if they had one lens, usually compound lens. This mirror here is used so you can look through and see that it's focused. So this mirror, you'll notice, goes out of the way, comes up here when you're taking a picture. So with a traditional camera, how many people have used a camera where when you take the picture, suddenly you can't see? Okay, a few. That's because that mirror moved out of the way so the light could go to the film. Or, these days, the CCD. Up here, we have something interesting. This lens here and this lens here, those are only used when you're focusing. Those are to make an image that your eyeball sees. This prism, notice this prism is rather complicated. It has five sides. And it's designed so that you have the reflections here so that you end up having your picture not inverted but upright. So there, the reason for that complicated prism is to get a non-inverted image. So you can see then when we take a picture, this thing flips up. This shutter opens, and then you have the film. The film, or image sensor, is the same as our retina. So we have, it does the same function. First thing you should note is that the image sensor, or the film, is flat, whereas our retina is not flat. The design is better with the curved retina than it is with a flat film. But that's something that we just try to manage because it's kind of hard to have the curved surface for taking a picture, whether it's a CCD or film in a camera. The shutter here doesn't exist in the eyeball. There's something the eyeball is missing that a camera has. How can we not have shutters in our eyeballs? Now, some people might say, oh, you have eye, you have Eyelids, thank you, yeah. These things that open and close, that's not the same thing as the shutter. You don't frame a picture. I don't open my eyes and just see one thing until I close them, right? I see things moving. But I don't see a blur. If you didn't have that shutter, if you just left it open, you would see a blur. So how, does, how do we deal with that since we don't have shutters? We have a brain instead. We have a brain that essentially frames pictures and takes a picture approximately 20 pictures per second. The, the rate varies on a number of things, but that's, that's what I've been taught for the approximate number. About 20 pictures a second is how quickly the eye takes a picture. And if it's brighter, it'll take them a little quicker. If it's dark, it'll take them a little slower. Which is why you can have sunglasses with one lens in and one lens out. And if you have something like a ball swinging back and forth, it'll look like it's doing an elliptical pattern because you have a delay on the eye that has the dark lens in front of it. It's called the Pulfrung effect. So our eye does framing, and this is actually important. Let's say you go watch an old movie. Old movies had frame rates of like 10 frames a second. Well, our eye has a frame rate of about 20 frames per second. 
So that means we have two pictures per slide of the old movie, and it looks very jerky. Have you guys seen that? You know what I'm talking about? So when they moved forward to modern cinema, they moved the frame rate from 10 frames per second or so up to 24 is the standard frame rate for modern cinema so that they're coming slightly faster than your eyeball's frame rate, and thus it looks like smooth motion. And then on TV monitors, you had the old standard of 30 frames per second. Now with HD, the standard is 60 frames per second. Those allow you to have smoother motion because you have multiple frames in one frame of the eye. So if you have something moving, you'll have frame here, frame here, frame here. They're all combined into basically one in the eye. The eye is not a pure framing system, so it still makes it look smoother. So that's an important difference there between the camera and the eyeball. Um, <laughs> this here is just talking about, yes, I talked about all of that looking at the opening slide. Simple lens calculations. You have a camera, a typical camera has a 50 millimeter focal length lens. And then you take photographs by moving that lens just a little closer or a little farther from the film. And so that would be how you would adjust the focus if you had only one lens. With multiple lenses, it's a little more complicated how you're adjusting the focus, but that's why we talk about one lens for general physics. <laughs> so just a question here. For an object at infinity, if you have a 50 millimeter lens, how far does the film have to be from the lens for you to have a picture that's in focus on the film? Yes. And if distance object is infinity, what's 1 over infinity? So that means the focal length has to be the distance image. So you're going to have the film 50 millimeters away from the lens for it to be in focus of something very far away. Now, if we bring something all the way up to 6 meters away, well, I'm going to have to actually do the calculation then. I'm going to have to put... 1 over, let's do everything in meters just for fun. So 50 millimeters is 0 0.0500 meters. There I just put the numbers right in. And I trust that you did the calculation already, Tori? She whipped that out as soon as we got to this. Yeah, it, it's not going to be exactly that. We want to know what it is. Okay, 0 0.0504. Hmm? Um, yeah, meters, okay. Or 50.4 millimeters. You don't have to move that lens very much to accommodate going from infinitely far away to six meters away. So... It's a very small motion there to do the focusing. Why am I doing this? I mean, you've already done homework like this, right? It's just to make sure we have the understanding of the fundamental behavior of a cam camera. Now things that are a little more complicated. Now, is there anyone here that's actually into photography? Cassie? Alone. <laughs> Jerry's pointing at somebody else. Oh, you are? Oh, okay. And Jer <laughs> Cash and Jerry. Okay. <laughs> Jerry says I'm still wrong. I'm not going to worry about Jerry anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the um, things that you adjust if you're taking pictures with a regular cal um, camera, 
These days, almost all of us are just using cell phones, right? We're not doing anything technical. We're also not getting very good pictures. If you have a high-quality camera, you are dealing with these things. And you're going to adjust the aperture, the size of the opening, and you have that shutter, and you're going to adjust the exposure time, also commonly called the shutter speed. So I want to make sure we understand what those are because it's basic physics that's involved when you're doing these adjustments. So first, talking about the <laughs> intensity. Because intensity is a vital aspect to making these decisions on shutter speed and aperture size. Okay, Helena put us over so we have a majority. Well, no, nine is not a majority. So it's at least not a minority. Okay, there's how the, uh, the answers broke down. Intensity. Intensity is defined as the power per unit area. So... Average energy per second, that's the definition of power. And then per area, well, there you have it. So intensity is that. When you're taking a picture, you need a certain amount of energy for it to have enough, ex um, if, if you're going old school with film, for it to have enough chemical reactions going on to make your picture dark enough. If you're using a CCD, it's going to be enough energy to cause enough electrons to be moved off. So when you're using a camera, the amount of energy received by the camera, called the exposure, is important. And you basically want to try to get that exposure about the same. So when you adjust the f-stop, which is the aperture size, when you adjust the shutter speed, the time that it's open, you want to try to aim for getting a constant exposure regardless of what you're doing. So in darker situations, to get the same exposure, you either need a bigger area or a longer time. So here I have the exposure equation. Exposure is just the intensity multiplied by the area of the aperture, how much light you're letting in, multiplied by the time that you have the aperture open. So now let's look at the things you set on the camera and how they affect that. So first you have that shutter speed. Shutter speeds are shown generally in fractions of a second, right? You usually aren't taking exposure longer than a second. You'd have serious blur unless you have a stationary object if you had exposure of a second. So some typical shutter speeds are shown there. One thousandth of a second, one five hundredth of a second, one two fiftieth of a second, one one twenty-fifth. It shifts a little bit. Each one of those was cut in half, right? Well, doubling the time, so cut the number of bottom in half until you get to 1 60th of a second. 60, of course, is not half of 125, but it's close. And then 1 30th, 1 15th, instead of going to 1 7 and a half, you go to 1 8th. Basically, each one is twice as long as the one before it. So when you talk about exposure, if you change your setting by one setting on the shutter speed, you're going to either double or have your exposure. Does that make sense? Which way would make it double the exposure? If I was at 1 over 2 50th of a second, which way would double the exposure? 
Okay, <laughs> what does this mean? Uh, to the one over 125. Going to the 1 to 1 over 25 would double the exposure. Going to the 1 over 500 would cut it in half. So if I'm talking about my picture, if, I, if it's perfect at this setting, and I go this setting, I'm going to have twice the exposure, and hence it's going to be too much light, and it'll be washed out. If I go to this setting, it'll be not enough light, and it'll be too dark. So that's where the shutter speed comes in, but the shutter speed doesn't work alone. We also have how big is the aperture. And the aperture size is determined by what's called the f-stop, or f-number. And the f-stop is a little more complicated. I'm not sure why they decided to make it complicated, but they did. The f-stops are listed as the focal length of the lens divided by the diameter of the lens. Or not lens, aperture. You, you do have lenses are actually also labeled with an f-stop. And so a lens that has a really big diameter can have an f number of like one. And they say it's a really fast lens because it allows a lot of light through if you open the aperture all the way up. Now, it seems odd to have them numbered like this. But if you think about it then, you have numbers f-stop 1 over 1, 1 over 1.4, 1, 1 over 2, 1 over, or they're not 1 over, f over 2.8. When you read these like this here, this is the f-stop number. So 2.8 is the number here. So if I have an f-stop of 2.8, I can calculate right away what my diameter is. My diameter is going to be... 50 millimeters divided by 2.8. So I can get for this one right here, and right away I can say, ah, well, 50 divided by 2.8 is, and I don't know what the number is. But it's, you know, that's what the diameter of my aperture is if my f-stop is 2.8. Now, you can actually see why they label it as f over n. What are they actually labeling? The diameter. So those numbers are the diameter. So your diameter is f over 1, f over 1 1.4, f over 2. Wow, that seems kind of odd sequencing of numbers, doesn't it? But it becomes much more obvious if you square them. If you square these, everybody knows one squared is bueno. One point four squared two. Two squared. Two point eight squared. Eight. Three would have been nine. Four squared? 5.6 squared. 32. What do you see in that sequence for squaring those numbers? Each one doubles. So the sequence of the f stops is such that you are going to, now this was the diameter was proportional to one over these. So each one is cutting that diameter squared in half. Well, how does diameter squared relate to exposure? Area for circle is pi r squared, or pi diameter squared over 4. So each successive f-stop is cutting the area in half. And thus, just like with the shutter speeds, 
if you were at 2 for your f-stop, if you went to 2.8, you would be cutting your area in half, and so you'd be getting half as much light through, half the exposure. If you went to 1.4, you would be doubling your area, thus doubling your light and making it more washed out. So the f-stop and the setter speed work together. So if you have a picture and you have it dialed into the right exposure, if you move the f-stop up one and the shutter speed down one, you have the same exposure. And that's the goal with those, to make it simple to adjust the exposure. So why have two things to adjust the exposure? Camera people. Well, that's true, but why have two things to adjust it? Why not just one? Okay, one concern is motion blur. If you're taking a picture of something moving, if you double the time to double your exposure, then you're going to see more blur in that moving thing. So for something like you know, a sporting event, you have somebody running to catch the ball, you don't want to see them going like this in the picture, you want to see them like this. And so you don't want to have a larger shutter speed. So instead of making a larger shutter speed, what do you do? By larger shutter speed, I mean longer time that it's open. Okay, you, you open the aperture up, which means you go to a lower number. Yeah. Right? The, the terminology, I'm pretty sure you were both meaning the same thing, but it sounds like you're saying opposite things because of the way the numbers go. So if you have something high speed, or something that's moving, you want to keep the shutter speed pretty quick, and so you open and close the aperture to adjust for light. On the other hand, there are some reasons why you might want to cut down or open up the size of that aperture, which I hope is what my next three slides are on. I don't know, this is just going through the math of what we already did. So, <laughs> okay, yes, the next three slides are on that. So, why you would want to change, or to have the shutter size, the aperture size, that's it, the aperture size being the controlling factor. When you have two objects that are not the same distance away from the lens, well, only one of them is going to be in focus, right? We already did that calculation. The other one, so in, in this picture, the yellow one is in focus. It's at the right position for the object to make an image on the film. The pink one is too close. And so the image from the pink one is behind the film. On the film, you have a spot that it makes but not a dot that it makes. A spot because the light, all the light that comes from that black point that's not on the plane comes together back here, but at the film, it's going to fill this region. And so that region it's filled, it's filling is called the circle of confusion. Now, if that circle of confusion is smaller than the smallest detail you can record, this far as your camera's concerned, it's still in focus. So if you can adjust that circle of confusion to make it smaller, then you can have a bigger range of distances that appear in focus to your camera. Even though one, only one is technically in focus, you'll have a range on either side where the circle of confusion is small enough that you can't tell it's out of focus. So we call this range that appears in focus the depth of field. And that's all I have this slide for, so I remember to say the word depth of field. So we use an aperture, and the aperture limits the paths that the light can take to go from the source through the lens to the film. And by limiting those paths, you take, for instance, this path here would go up like this, and it just gets blocked. And so we don't have the light that's coming downward, right, that one was coming downward. And so by cutting that out, 
we make the circle of confusion smaller. And so that's going to make us have a bigger depth of field, a bigger range that appears in focus. So the smaller the aperture, the larger the range of focus. So if I want to do something really cliche, like I'm in Paris, and I want my wife to be here and having her finger on the top of the Eiffel Tower in my picture. Right? That's done by approximately 90% of the people who go to the Eiffel Tower. Well, I get back here, so I have perspective just right. But I want her to be in focus, and I want the Eiffel Tower to be in focus. So I need to have a big depth of field. In order to accomplish that, I make a small aperture size. But if I still want to have my right exposure, I'm going to have to have a longer time that the shutter is open to get the right exposure. So to get that large depth of field, I need a small aperture size. Well, what if instead of that, I have a, a bee that is pollinating a flower, and I want to take a picture of that bee, and I think it's really artsy-fartsy to have the bee in focus, but the flower completely out of focus. What is that going to have to be in terms of depth of field? Big depth of field or small depth of field? A small depth of field. So how do I accomplish that small depth of field? A really big aperture. Now, I also used to mock. A lot of people used to, when I was in high school, take these soft focus pictures for their senior portraits, where like their eyes and their mouth are in focus and their ears are already you know, completely out of focus. And I always figured, OK, the people doing these are the people who like aren't confident that they're pretty enough. And so make it so you're all obscured and, you know, Wow, what beautiful eyes. Um, to accomplish that, you'd have to have a big aperture. So that's why you have the two controls, not just one control. And I believe this goes to, yes, the camera obscura, or a pinhole camera. With my iPhone, I do have some focus control. So that means I actually have some motion in there for my lenses. But back when I was a kid, <laughs> well, a kid, you know, in, in college, we went on choir tour to Hong Kong. My mom gave me a camera. Here, here's the camera, and here's the film. As you might have guessed, or maybe not, I took zero pictures. <laughs> my point was she could make me take a camera. She couldn't make me use it. But this camera was a camera that even I could figure out. It was a uh, 110 Instamatic or something like that. All you had to do was point and shoot, boom, boom, boom. And it was always in focus. OK, so that's always in focus. It's pretty awesome. Some idiot like me can take pictures. How is it possible for the camera to be always in focus? If you have a pinhole, your circle of confusion is so small that everything is in focus. So this picture shows a candle. And you look at the light coming from the tip of the candle. Now light from the tip of that candle is going in all directions. But the only light that gets through the hole is going a very specific direction. And all the light from the tip of the candle that went through that hole meets right there. And since the image is formed where all of the light that leaves one point on the object meets again, it's in focus. It's not a true image because you didn't have multiple rays come back to each other. But it's always in focus with the pinhole camera. Now, we had some students who got some little disposable cameras for their project. And those disposable cameras, now, do they have lens? Yes. And they are surprisingly, actually, I think, had focus too, didn't they? Usually those things don't have a focus. They are working on the pinhole principle, but they still have a lens. Really low quality lens, by the way. What would the purpose of the lens be if it's not focusing? If it's a pinhole, so it's always in focus. It's not, I mean, like distorting kind of part of it, or it's well, rounded? It's not distortion, but it's, you're on the right track. It's changing the magnification. The purpose of that lens is just to change the magnification. And it's pretty reasonably bad quality. They don't have, they just made a little plastic, you know, extrude the plastic and there's your lens. Because you're not focusing anything. 
you're just spraying the light out. So these kind of cameras, camera obscures, always in focus. Because you're at the ultimate for the depth of field. So when we have a solar eclipse, who knows when we're going to have a solar eclipse? You do? Wait. August of 2017. I don't remember the date. It's like August 21, 15, 17, somewhere in that ballpark. And we will be right at the edge of totality here in Lincoln. If you go down to like Nebraska City, it'll be a complete um, eclipse, which is totally cool. Right? If you're in the Midwest, you should totally observe that thing. Because it's not that often you see a solar eclipse. You have to be the right place on Earth at the right time to see a solar eclipse. Well, <laughs> what you don't do during a solar eclipse is say, hey, everybody, look at the sun. Because right? looking at the sun is bad. You can get too much light and scar your eye. So a good safe way of observing it is by using this pinhole camera idea. Just take a piece of paper or something, punch a hole in it, Hold it above another piece of paper and look at the other piece of paper. And just like the camera obscura, you have everything's in focus and you can see the entire thing. You can do that right now. You, if there are sunspots on the sun, you can do that and you'll see there where the dark spots are. Where the solar storms are that suppress the temperature instead of being around 6,000 Kelvins, it's about... 4,000 Kelvins, I think? It, it depends. But it, it depresses the temperature, and because it's lower temperature, it's obviously not giving off as much light, and you can see those. So that's a good safe way. Another way, of course, might be a welding helmet or something like that. Or you can get glasses that are um, hydrogen um, blockers. They, they block, block the hydrogen lines so that, you, or I think it's hydrogen lines, I don't know. We, we get those things. By the way, don't be stupid. We had a partial eclipse a few years back, and I used the telescope. And the telescope has a filter so that it's safe to look at the sun, the solar filter. But when you're lining it up, I want to make sure I have it lined up right. And so I put my little eyeglass protector in front of the eyepiece of the view, viewfinder thing, where the light is already focused. And so I burned a hole through it, so I'm sitting here, oh, <laughs> That was bad, but it didn't, didn't harm my vision, I don't think. So if I put on the other side, it would have been just fine. I just put it on the wrong side. Okay, lenses in combination. Lenses in combination is really leading into the telescopes and the microscopes, what we usually think of as our optical instruments. And before we actually talk telescopes and microscopes, we're going to talk about a single lens viewing. But lenses in combination, we have to understand. So a first thing that we've learned about light, light works the same forward and backward, right? So I have light, light comes, light goes through a lens, refraction makes it come to a focus. I can take that light, and it doesn't matter where the source was, all that matters is I have this light. And I can extrapolate forward and backward to what's going to happen. Well, if I put a second lens in, then I can say, okay, the light goes through the first lens, it makes an image, the image from the first lens will be just become my object for the second lens. Even if that image doesn't really occur, it's a virtual image, it's just the rays traveling through space, and I still can work it that way. So the key for lenses in combination is you have the light hits the first lens, and you calculate where the image would be for that first lens. And then that image for the first lens becomes the object for the second lens. And this leads to some interesting possibilities. Um, by the way, this is using P and Q for distance object and distance image because I forgot to change it. <laughs> different textbook, different nomenclature. All right, so I think I got a picture here. Oh, not yet. I'll talk about that part when I get to the picture. See the next two slides for the pictures. <laughs> okay, first the simple case. I have a single object labeled there as object. I have a lens, and so I can calculate using the thin lens equation 
where the image is formed, or I can draw rays. What are the rays I would use to draw this? Do you remember names for them? Okay. In my tutorial, <laughs> which as of yesterday no one had watched, we had the parallel ray, the focal ray, and the vertex ray. And so you have to know where the principal and the secondary focal points are to draw two of these three. So now, <clears throat> I am going to cheat on the first line, and then from that, I will try to be honest for the rest. So the parallel ray. The parallel ray starts at the tip of the object and goes parallel to the principal axis until it hits the center of the lens. Thin lens approximation, everything occurs at the center of the lens. Then it goes from there through the focal point and on. So I cheated because I know where it has to go, but now I can make a measurement. I can say, aha, I must have there's my focal length. And now I'm going to take this and duplicate it. Uh, shoot. Forgot to duplicate it first. <laughs> Close enough. Duplicate. And put it over here as well. <laughs> Close enough. And so now I can mark my two focal points. My two focal points are going to be, here is the principal focal point. Here is the secondary focal point. Um, put it below. So I have the first ray. The second ray here is my focal ray. The focal ray is exactly the opposite of the parallel ray. It's going to go from the tip of my object through the focal point until it hits the center of the lens. And then it's going to come out of that lens parallel. <laughs> And you can see, well, I didn't measure things out. This is not going to come out anywhere close to perfect. Because you see those two don't cross where my pencil is. The third ray is the vertex ray. The vertex ray, I didn't need anything special for. The vertex ray goes from the tip of the object through the vertex, which is where the center of the lens crosses the principal axis, and then just does a straight line. And... <laughs> Hey, all three of my lines cross the same place. It's just the wrong place. And so based on the focal points I made, the image here would have been there. So you can use ray construction to find where the image is, or you can also use the thin lens equation, which we've used earlier today, 1 over F equals 1 over distance object plus 1 over distance image. So we can do that to find where the first image is. Question? Oh, yeah. For the blue line I missed, uh, do you, how did you know where to put that? Did you just do the opposite of the red one? Or? Um, it, it is exactly the opposite of the red one. And by that we mean it starts at the tip of the object, goes through the secondary focal point, the one that I marked as F prime. I marked as F prime because the secondary focal point is the place where light would have originated if it comes out of the lens parallel. Or if light came in from the right side, where it would converge. That's F prime. If I have parallel rays to the left side, where they converge is F. Okay. So the focal ray is going through F prime until it hits the center of the lens. And then it comes out of the lens parallel to the principal axis. Okay. The big F is the prime symbol or something? The, there's, the prime is this thing. That there is the prime. Okay. So this one here is the principal focal point. This one here is the secondary focal point because it has that prime. Okay. So that's how we do the first image. Well, now if we put a second lens there, second lens, here's the image for the first one. 
What is distinctly disturbing about the image for the first one? It's on the wrong side of the second lens. So instead of being a real image, that's also a virtual image because the rays are not going to actually meet there at image position one. The second lens is going to make them change directions. But all we're dealing with is how the light bends. And so we still take this and we say, this first image is going to be my object. Uh, back to the pin. This is my object two. It's image one and object two. So now we look at my object distance. That object distance is on the wrong side of the lens. So it's a negative object distance. So in this case, my distance object two is equal to the separation between the two, which was marked as S here minus the distance image one. And since distance image one was a bigger number than the separation, it turns out that it's a negative object distance. But that's OK. And so then I take this, and I can do ray diagrams, or I can use the thin lens equation and find where the image created by the second lens is, and that's my final image. Now, in this picture, it's shown the final image is back here. Is that final image real or virtual? It's virtual because the rays don't really meet there. What happens with the light rays? Let's take, for instance, a parallel ray. A parallel ray is going to start like this. It hits this. And then it's going to be converging so it goes like this. And I don't know where to put the focal point, so I'm just going to make it like that. And then it hits here, and it diverges so it comes out like that. Right? So the parallel ray does something like that. Well, that's a little disconcerting for, compared to what we're used to seeing. If I take the focal ray for the first one, the focal ray goes something like this, then it goes like this, and then it goes like this. Well, these two don't meet. Hence, it's virtual. What does meet is the rear extrapolations of the two. And of course, you know I did these freehand, so these aren't really going to meet at the right spot. But we have that virtual image because the rays that came out appear as if they would have converged back there behind lens two. So that's a virtual image. It's also an upright image. Now, we learn with a single lens, if it's a single lens, a virtual image is always upright. With a double lens, that's not true. It could go either way. So in this case, it was an upright virtual image. But I could have had an upright real image, or I could have had an inver inverted real or an inverted virtual. Depends on the positions of the lenses. Question? It's upright because it's the same orient oh Richard. It's the same orientation as the original object. Yeah, no, I understand that that's oh, about upright. Okay. I'm just asking if the reason that it's upright in this case is because the first image is past the second lens. It, it is it is because of two things, not just that. It's that combined with this being a negative focal length lens. Right, so it's it's more complicated and you just basically have to look at each one. So we will end with this. In a two-lens system, what is the object for the second lens?
Okay, well our answers were 1, 1, and 13. And the 13 are right. The image created by the first lens is the object for the second lens. So yes, I did not do telescopes or microscopes. So don't worry about moving to chapter 27 for Concept Coach. I will be doing telescopes and microscopes on Friday.